Hello, welcome to the Friday, May 21st, 2021 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. First, to start out with, uh, got a little a new project, a series of videos that's supposed to cover everything about DNS. Now, still producing those, just made the first one live today. You'll find a link in the show notes and no idea how many of these videos I'll produce. Probably will be a few to really cover everything about DNS. And then we got a new twist uh, to ransomware. In this case, it's uh, the Irish HSE, that's the Health Services Executive or essentially the Department of Health that was infected by the Conti ransomware about a week ago and well decided not to pay. Now, uh, this has caused, of course, some issues with access to healthcare in Ireland. And after the ransomware gang uh, figured out they're not going to get paid, they played their second trick where they started to leak the data. In the past, when ransomware leaked data, it was often uh, internal corporate documents. But in this case, it's individuals' personal information and healthcare data that's being leaked. And it's not clear if it's the ransomware gang itself or if this is sort of parasites that are now taking advantage of the leaked data. But apparently, individuals in Ireland are receiving phone calls claiming to come from a healthcare provider. This... uh, provider then uh, identifies themselves by using data that was leaked and that includes uh, address, date of birth and also recent medical procedures. And then uh, they claim that you have a refund coming and they need your banking information in order to transfer the money to you. Of course, the goal here is to steal your money, not to give you anything extra. The ransomware gang has actually made a decryptor available to the HSE for free now. Not sure if it's working, but they stated that, yes, they handed them the decryptor, given that uh, it affects sort of public services uh, in Ireland, but uh, they're still going to continue to leak uh, the data. Of course, this will make authenticating any call from a healthcare provider in Ireland uh, very difficult and uh, probably just a glimpse of uh, what's going to come in future similar breaches. Whenever a new uh, patch is being released by a vendor, of course, the big question is how quickly do we need to apply this patch? We definitely want to do so before the attackers are going to exploit them. And as a first step, you probably need to figure out, do you have any vulnerable systems? And of course, attackers are going through a similar process. If you wonder how quick you have to be in order to outrun the attackers, well, according to a paper published by Palo Alto, it took attackers about five minutes after Microsoft announced the recent patch for Microsoft Exchange before Palo Alto did notice first scans for this vulnerability, or at least uh, attempts to enumerate uh, Microsoft Exchange servers. This matches uh, what we have seen ourselves in the past, where immediately after a vulnerability is announced, attackers will typically scan the internet trying to find vulnerable systems, even if they don't have an exploit yet. So once they have an exploit, they can deploy that exploit as quickly as possible against a list of pre-selected targets. Well, it's Friday again, and uh, Fridays, of course, we often have a science.edu student here to talk about uh, research. Adam uh, Baker is with me here today. Uh, Adam, uh, could you introduce yourself, please? Yes, thanks. Thanks for the opportunity. I am currently the director of security operations for a large educational institution. And then prior to that, for 15 years, I, I worked in and around the U.S. military. I was a special forces soldier then taught digital forensics to special forces soldiers and then got into geospatial intelligence analysis. So that's really me in a nutshell for about the last 18 years. Geospatial intelligence, that sort of leads us a little bit to your paper, or could you introduce your paper a little bit? So the title is GPS for Authentication, Is the Juice Worth the Squeeze? And uh, really, the point of the research was to try to quantify uh, how much 
more precise GPS is over IP addresses for authentication for network transactions, and then potentially make the case for its wider use. Let's start with the simplest form of a geolocation, essentially looking up the IP address in some database that you purchased that links IP addresses to location. Of course, lots of horror stories around that. I think there's a farm in the middle of Kansas that sort of is the default location for some IP address where people show up to get their data back. But uh, what, what did you find? How good are these databases? It will probably help if I make the distinction between accuracy and precision when it comes to geolocation. Um, if, I, if I'm right now in the United States and my, you know, my IP address shows as in the United States, well, that's an accurate statement. But if all anybody can know about me is that I'm in the United States, that's not horribly precise. And so the problem with some of the geodatabases is their levels of precision and what their users understand about the levels of precision. So for example, um, in 2014, some work was done to try to quantify which algorithms that are used by geodatabase companies to and geoservice providers to determine someone's location based on their IP address. And they use a variety of means to do it. They'll use um, different, like I said, different algorithms based on delays, based on landmarks that are, you know, known network nodes that everybody knows. If my traffic passes through Harvard's router, then they know that I'm somewhere in the Northeast of the United States, for example. Um, so different algorithms were used. In 2014, some, some research was done to try to quantify which was the best and what were their levels of precision. And the best were in the United States, where it was about 40 kilometers. They said 35 to 40 kilometers precision in the U.S. with a particular um, type of algorithm. And it, fast forward to about 2019, the largest, uh, at the time, the largest provider of geodatabase services to companies who are looking to geolocate their, their users um, boasted of an 82% accuracy in the United States within 25 miles. So 25 miles is 40 kilometers. So in that five years, um, the level of precision had basically stalled. We weren't getting any more precise. In the early days, it was hundreds of kilometers and work was done to, to make that as more precise. But we had basically stalled um, based on the research that I had done in deriving precision out of IP-based geoloc geolocational coordinates. I would imagine it really depends on the type of IP address too. Like uh, you know, if you have a, a mobile device that's uh, by its nature uh, not tethered to a particular location, uh, of course, its IP address keeps changing too. On the other hand, you know, my cable modem uh, IP address here for my house, which uh, I have for the last few years, uh, should be relatively easy to locate. Uh, is this sort of part of what uh, figures in here too? Yes, great, great point. Um, in fact, if you look at the largest, one of the largest geodatabase providers right now is MaxMind. It's a US-based company. MaxMind's geodatabase, when you go onto their website, they'll actually tell you, you can look up precision by location. You can do it by country in the US, you can do it down to the state or potentially even the city. And when you when you look at just uh, wired addresses or you know Wi-Fi based addresses, you're still looking at about that 80% accuracy within 40 kilometers or 25 miles. When you include cellular uh, IPs, the accuracy drops down to between 60 and 65%. So you're absolutely right. There, the, depending on the kind of IP, um, it only gets worse from the 82% within 25 miles figure. It doesn't get better. Yeah, and uh, and then of course on the sort of extreme end, I've seen like some attacks sort of use these satellite services, and not necessarily sort of Starlink and such, but these geostationary satellite services that uh, you can connect to from wherever you are. And of course, then the IP address is more linked to the satellite service, which of course has a random a ground station location that's not linked to the actual client. Right, that's exactly right. And you see the you see that parallel problem set, which is uh, ultimately we are you know the geodatabase company is tying your location to a known landmark and trying to triangulate you off of really some ethereal data. 
because it, it, it doesn't always apply to you. So, when, I mean, how many of us have gone to where's my IP, right? Just to see yeah. what, what my current connection says my location is. And in my case, you know, I, I have seen it regularly be 25, 30 miles off it. And it, it, it can go to the ISP's headquarters address or, you know, where their, where their large network uh, equipment is. But um, that, it's the same problem when, when you when using IP address for geolocation, it's exactly the same set of problems across any of the technologies that we use to connect to the internet. So now, of course, in particular, if you have a mobile device, it probably comes with a GPS sensor. And uh, that GPS sensor is then even accessible via web applications. Uh, do they work better or any reason not to use uh, those? Great question. So they work a ton better. And that was really the thrust of the paper was to try to figure out how much more precise GPS coordinates are. And in this case, uh, the thought process was, okay, if I'm going to try to advocate for an authentication provider using GPS coordinates then and a building that into their uh, authentication schema, then they potentially are going to start asking for GPS coordinates from devices that have not historically had to provide them. So for example, laptop computers or IoT devices, security cameras, those kinds of things, as they authenticate to a network, if they're gonna be asked you know, about a GPS code for a GPS coordinate as part of the authentication, then I couldn't just use the GPS data, the precision data that has been derived from mobile devices because mobile devices generally have a slightly higher uh, higher cost, higher accuracy, higher quality uh, a GPS a chip inside the device. So um, my research actually focused on the GPS accuracy available via low cost GPS chips um, and to see, to compare worst and average of the data that I gather against the best of the IP address based geolocational precision um, to get a good basis for comparison. But isn't it the problem that it's trivial for the user to fake those coordinates? So um, what are the use cases here? You probably don't want to lock someone in automatically just by providing the right GPS coordinates, sir. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the re actually, the, what kicked this paper off was a presentation by the largest identity as a service provider uh, in the United States in 2019. I was at a conference a local conference information security organization and uh, uh, one of the representatives of this organ of the company was talking about their new authentication scheme and how it was a tiered scheme so depending on the level of uh, assessed validity of the factors that they were asking of the user who was requesting authentication that would determine how much more uh, validity they would need in order to certify that the person was the person and allow them access. So the idea was if that this is one of a series of factors that's going to be assessed about a human, whether you know they're going to get a push notification or something else, um, as is common in most of our authentication schemes now, you've got a password, um, in some cases, even passwordless authentication. But if if you can get to millions of times more precise locational information, well, that may change and enhance the tiers that I'm using for my authentication scheme. And it may, it may allow me to do some things which I, which I can't do now. One of the things that um, potentially, if we go from, in the US, the best case is a, of an urban area, city level precision. And that's being very generous. You know, you put a 25 mile radius around New York City, you're going to catch more than the city. The same thing applies to Chicago and, for example, Los Angeles. The, the radius there is, is smaller than 25 miles. So you're potentially talking about right now with the with just on the basis of geolocation and no other factor. Um, you can't distinguish between two people in New York on a geospatial basis. I, heck, I can't do it. And I live in a much smaller town, and and but it's 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 still less than 25 miles. And so, when we start talking about adding 
millions of, of times better precision, then we can get to the point where, you know, embracing privacy concerns as well, because we talk about that in the paper as well, but potentially methods to be able to distinguish between people at city block level or even at house level. Um, and at that point, it becomes harder to fake the factors uh, because it's a lot more precise. And somebody who is in my same building or on my same neighborhood who's trying to present themselves as me has a harder time doing it. Whereas right now in the current scheme, as long as they're in the same city, best case scenario, there's there's no way to know that from a geospatial perspective, that isn't me. So a use case would be that uh, I come to a website, you ask me for my username and password, and then you do some checking on my IP address, my geolocation. Does anything look off? And if so, then you would, for example, throw in a capture or some other form of authentication uh, to make sure it's actually me. Exactly. Exactly. That that if the if the geospatial pattern of life, for example, uh, didn't look like me, that they that I would be asked for additional validating features. This is already being used in a really limited scope by certain banks. Um, you may have seen, I've seen a little bit of the advertising that talks about, you know, you'll get a notification, hey, you're being, you know, someone is trying to conduct a transaction at this location. Is that you? Yep. So there's a variation of that. And because the, geo, the GPS data is available coming from the mobile device, the bank can actually use it. Um, but I'm talking about a much wider application for the same basic technology. So we'll have the paper uh, listed in the show notes, uh, so you'll uh, be able uh, to uh, read it in its entirety. And of course, we sort of just scratch a little bit uh, the surface here. Uh, any final words, anything that we missed uh, that you would like uh, the listeners to know? Uh, just, just a couple of things. Um, the first is, um, I, I myself have privacy concerns. So uh, privacy concerns for you know, potentially the companies I use knowing exactly where I am are absolutely a factor. And in the paper, we address and present a possible solution to that in the form of a geospatial data broker. So if you think of right now, it, it's a parallel use case to like a DuckDuckGo or one of a privacy-oriented driver where a browser where the entity has an agreement with the user that they're never going to share their information without that user's consent. At that point, um, I introduced the concept of a geo token, which is if the if a geospatial data browser or a ge, or a broker or a geo broker is acting as a third party between the user who's requesting authentication and the authentication provider. So uh, in that scenario, a user you know initiates a request for something, the authentication provider then reaches out to the geo broker and says, "I need a confidence level that this person is." who they say they are, at least from a geospatial perspective. And so what they get in return is a token that includes a level of confidence based on the user's pattern of life that's maintained by the geo broker, not by the authentication provider. So a trusted third party with a really ironclad contract with the user that maintains that geospatial information that only passes off a certification of validity or a level of confidence in, a, in the form of a token to the authentication provider. And then they can use that and determine whether or not they would want uh, additional information. The other thing I would say coming out of the paper is, to, you know, spoiler alert, the best IP, uh, the worst GPS-based coordinate is 2.37 million times more precise than the best IP-based geocoordinate. Um, if you get to the average GPS, this is with low cost GPSs. I built these devices with the GPS units cost $2.74. So this is a really low cost GPS unit. Um, the average geo coordinate that I collected was 60, 64 million times more precise than IP address uh, when it came to geolocation. So with, it's worth looking into more deeply based on those factors. Excellent. So thank you for joining us here. Thanks, everybody, for listening and uh, talk to you again on Monday. Thanks.